I'll share that program with you. Hopefully you can see our program. I'd just like to say good morning um, to everyone or good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are around the world. And thank you very much for joining us today and welcome to this session on solutions to pollution, contaminant impacts and remediation in Antarctica. This is the third session out of three. We had two really successful programs yesterday with a number of speakers. And this is this one today um, particularly focuses on microplastics. Most of the talks are around that topic. So um, if you joined us yesterday, sorry, you'll know some of this uh, housekeeping I'm gonna tell you, but if you didn't, welcome. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Catherine King. I'm a principal research scientist at the Australian Antarctic Division. And I'll be chairing the session alongside my colleagues, Drs. Catherine Brown and Jane Wosley, who also work here at the division. They'll be co-convening and helping with this session. Um, together with the IT, IT team on the ground, we hope to deliver a smooth session for you today and, and hopefully not too many IT hiccups. Um, a little bit about the session. So we all know Antarctic terrestrial and marine ecosystems are, are subject to human disturbance at, at both global, at, at, at global, regional, and also local scales. And as human activities in Antarctica continue to grow, we, we're placing increasing stress on Antarctic ecosystems and the potential for environmental impacts increases. So this session today and the two yesterday um, are really providing a platform for us as researchers in this area to, to quantify the scale of this problem and in some ways propose some solutions for minimising environmental risk and impacts of contaminants, including microplastics and nanoplastics on Antarctic ecosystems. Um, this session has, it has, um, well, I think we've just got an additional speaker. So we're gonna have seven speakers followed by a discussion um, period at the end where we can raise more questions for our speakers or we can just talk about any topic that, that people are interested in, in discussing with this uh, panel of experts. So I invite you to think about that as well for discussion at the end. And hopefully there'll be some of the people that, were, that joined us yesterday as well um, to contribute to that. Just some housekeeping for you. Um, each speaker has 10 minutes. Uh, to speak followed by two minutes of questions so please keep track of your time um, jane will let you know if you're running over time we'll give you a warning at that 10 minute mark so then wrap up if you can uh, please ask your questions by typing them into the q a box function so that's at the bottom of your zoom screen there's a q a box and if you type your questions there um kath in particular but all of us will, will keep track of that and and raise those with the speakers Everyone except the, the current presenter and convener should be muted at all times, and that should happen through IT, but if something goes wrong, just make sure you're muted if you're not speaking. And you, you will, will be made aware that the presentations are being recorded. They are to be available at the SCAR virtual platform in the, in the past events section, straight after, after the conclusion of this session. They'll also be available via the SCAR YouTube channel within 24 hours of the session end. Please, if you don't want your talk to be uh, recorded, let us know at the start and the IT team will pause the recording on that. And similarly, if you don't want your presentation made available on YouTube, send an email to opt out to the, um, the conference organising committee. And a final reminder is just for the e-posters, um, which, is in the ex exhibition space on the events platform. You can go and browse those posters anytime for the duration of the conference. And we have, we have 12 posters for this session for you to check out. Also at the end, when we have that discussion um, section at the end of this session, I'll invite if there are any attendees that have uh, provided e-posters, if they wanted to give us a, a, a short synopsis of those, that would be a good time to do that as well, to give them a bit of floor space. All right, so I'll stop sharing and I will invite our first speaker, which is uh, Daniel Wilson. And Daniel Wilson is from Exeter University and we're talking about microplastic pollution in the Southern Ocean. So go ahead, Daniel, beautiful. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Is that sharing my screen okay? Yep, that's perfect. Brilliant, I shall, uh, I shall get going. So yeah, good morning to those of you watching. Um, please do forgive me if I appear a little bit blurry eyed. It's, uh, it's just ticked past 4 a.m. here in the UK. So 
Today, I'm going to talk about the work that I've been completing as part of my PhD based down in, here in Cornwall at the University of Exeter. So my PhD aims to use computer modelling to better understand how plastic pollution moves around the, the, in the Southern Ocean. And this talk will focus on the work that we've done so far to set up and validate our model, describe the work that's currently ongoing to understand the transport of plastic pollution across the Antarctic circumpolar current, and then outline where we plan to take the project during the last year of my PhD. So when referring to microplastics in this presentation, we're characterizing them as such plastics that are less than five millimeters in size. And so the Southern Ocean has long been considered a pristine marine environment, protected from pollutants such as plastics by the fast eastward flowing currents that make up the Antarctic circumpolar current. You can see the Antarctic circumpolar current here in figure one marked by those black lines going up around the Southern Ocean. And macroplastics and microplastics have been recorded by a number of different studies in the Southern Ocean, especially around the West Antarctic Peninsula, such as the, that research by Lacerda and others in 2019, which you can see in figure two. So this shows us that plastics are present in the Southern Ocean and south of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And it's important to understand how microplastics travel throughout the Southern Ocean, as they've been linked to negative impacts on keystone species, such as Antarctic krill, especially when comparing the impact of plastic pollution with other anthropogenic climate stresses. And so whilst there are a number of local sources for microplastics in the Southern Ocean, such as science and cruise operations, these sources alone are unlikely to account for the quantity of plastics recovered in the Southern Ocean, suggesting that long distance travel into the region is taking place. But the transport pathways of these microplastics into the Southern Ocean and across the Antarctic Circumpolar Current are mostly unknown, and it's this knowledge gap that my project aims to tackle. So to tackle this question, we're utilizing the Lagrangian particle tracking framework, Ocean Parcels. This will be forced with ocean velocity fields from a Southern Ocean configuration of the NEMO LIM3 model, which has one twelfth of a degree horizontal resolution and 75 variable depth Z levels. And it's been developed by the orchestra project. When plastic particles are at the very surface of the ocean, they'll also be forced with three hour, 0.5 degree resolution Stokes Drift flow fields from the Wave Watch 3 project. And Stokes Drift can be defined as the net movement of a particle at the surface ocean, surface of the ocean in the direction of wave propagation. We're also applying a horizontal diffusion parameterization of up to 10 meters squared a second. And we'll also be applying a vertical diffusion component when we move to 3D modeling. Our time step for the model is 30 minutes. And so far our sensitivity testing has suggested that the inclusion of Stokes drift has the effect of a net south and eastward push on particles. So to understand how our orchestra flow fields compare with the real Southern Ocean, we've compared our orchestra flow fields to Copernicus glob current satellite derived flow fields. You can see here in, if I get the laser pointer, in figure A and figure B, that the major oceanographic fronts and flows that make up the Antarctic, similar, Antarctic circumpolar current are in similar locations. And you can also see from figure C that the, there are some areas of the orchestra flow fields where the uh, flow fields are slightly slower than satellite derived flow fields which you can see by some of the, uh, the areas in blue, which represent areas of the model that were slightly slower than the satellite flow fields. But generally, it's a really favorable comparison. So the remoteness and expense involved in collecting microplastic data from the Southern Ocean has limited microplastic observations that can be taken. And it's also led to a clustering of observations around the West Antarctic Peninsula. There are also significant methodological differences between studies that look at microplastics in the Southern Ocean that make the combining of data from different studies and subsequent comparison with our model results particularly challenging. So in order to be confident that our model is producing 
realistic transport pathways in the Southern Ocean, we undertook a process of drift comparison. We took 40 National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Global Drifter Project drifters from right around the Southern Ocean, and we replicated those in our model setup. There was no diffusion or Stokes drift in these models, and the model particles were fixed at 15 meters depth, which is the same depth as the drogue that's attached to the, the buoy containing the GPS on a NOAA Global Drifter Project drifter. We released a 10 kilometer radius cloud of model drifters once a day for 14 days before and after when the Global Drifter Project Drifter was released into the real world. This allowed us to get an understanding of how plausible the trajectories generated by the model were. Overall, the model drifter trajectories show a really good level of agreement with the Global Drifter Project Drifter trajectories. And there's some particularly well-matched drifters, such as that in figure four, where you can see the red trajectories or the red lines are those generated by our model. And you can compare that to the real world global drifter project trajectory in that blue line. So after analyzing the drifter displacement, the modeled drifter displacement distance and bearing at different time steps, five of these 40 drifters were considered a less well, less well, less good match. Although satellite analysis of these less good matches revealed that where drift model drifters deviated from real world drifter trajectories, this was often a result of relatively small differences in ocean flow locations and speeds, rather than more systematic differences in flows and fronts. And so whilst there was a spread in how well matched drifters were, there were no clusters of particularly poorly matched drifters either, allowing us to have confidence that our modeling will show plausible tra pl plastic transport trajectories. So this leads me nicely to what we're currently working on at the minute. We're using sea surface height data from the orchestra output to extract the northern and southern boundaries of the Antarctic circumpolar current. These absolute contour values can then be used as a good approximation for the north-south boundary of the Antarctic circumpolar current around the Southern Ocean, similar to how Sokolov and Rintel used those um, contours in 2009. We plan to use the southern boundary to help determine when particles have crossed the Antarctic circumpolar current. And we're using the northern boundary to ensure that we release microplastic particles north of the Antarctic circumpolar current to better understand how and where they're crossing the Antarctic circumpolar current. So to do this, we use GIS software to add a buffer, a 25 to 100 kilometer buffer to this northerly contour and compute release locations for particles every 0.1 degrees of longitude and latitude within this buffer area. So you can see here on this slide where we've released particles in that buffer region that you can see there in the figure. And so if I flick to the, um, to the next slide, hopefully now you can see the second figure where you can see where those particles that started in that band release have traveled to after two years of modeling. And so this is a uh, hot off the press over the weekend model. So please excuse my lack of uh, more detailed analysis. But early indications are suggesting that this region to the east of the Drake Passage could play a particularly important role in the cross transport, in the cross Antarctic circumpolar current transport of microplastics. So this leads nicely onto my final slide, which is where we plan to take the project during its last year. We're planning to explore the impact of both seasonal and annual variation in the transport of microplastics across the Antarctic circumpolar current. And this may include understanding the impact of multi-year variation, such as a Southern annular mode and Pacific decadal observation, which could provide insights into how microplastic transport in the Southern Ocean could change with global warming. We'll be carrying out detailed statistical analysis of source areas and crossing regions for microplastics that make it across the Antarctic circumpolar current. We'll model the transport of microplastics of different densities in three dimensions. And sea ice has been reported to act as a sponge, entroning microplastics in the austral autumn and winter when sea ice advances, and then releasing those plastics when sea ice retreats. And so we plan to parameterize this effect of sea ice on the transport of microplastics in the Southern Ocean. We'll also be looking to incorporate a uniform particle release into our model, allowing for the identification of hotspot areas in the Southern Ocean where microplastic concentrations are likely to be highest 
and it may be sensible to direct future efforts to understand the impacts of microplastics on marine life in the Southern Ocean. So thank you very much for listening, and I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dan, for that um, very interesting presentation. Uh, there are a couple of questions, but I think we'll just have to hold those, if that's okay, to the end of this. Oh, actually, no, you're, it's 4 a.m., isn't it? Um, Don't worry, I'm planning on it being here for the whole session. Are you? Okay. If, if that's okay, Dan, I appreciate that. And we'll, um, that can kick off our, our session at the end, our discussion at the end. No worries. Okay. So uh, our next speaker is a recording, Emily, from Emily Rowlands, uh, who's from Bass, and, she's, and the presentation will be about the effects of nanoplastics on quill embryos. So hopefully the IT team will get that loaded. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that, Emily. Do we have any, we've got maybe half a minute. We've got any questions? Uh, there's some questions uh, earlier on, uh, which are for Dan uh, Wilson. Okay. Which I can see he's typing in an answer at the moment to one of them, but uh, none for Emily's talk so far. Okay. We're actually running a little behind time, so we perhaps should hold questions to the end anyway. Okay. Thanks, Shane. All right, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Elisa Bagami, uh, who will be talking about plastic microfibers in the Antarctic whelk. Um, so I believe you're online. If you can share your slide, that'd be great. Yeah. Not there. No, she has not joined the webinar. Ah. Not there. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Ilaria Kosi. I'm co author of the paper. Yes. And I'm uh, here on behalf of Elisa. She's my postdoc. So I, I joined the seminar on LBL. Okay, thanks, Ilaria. Sorry, I have a bit of confusion of, of who was presenting. No, don't, but don't worry, it's okay. Don't worry. You have um you have panelist uh right, so you can you can start sharing now if you'd like. No, actually, Elisa already uploaded the the recorded uh, presentation, so you should have it. It do you do you have that? <clears throat> No, ma'am, we don't have any. Uh, well, there's been a lot of email exchange between you and Elisa. So she uploaded a recorded version uh, 10 days ago and because she's the main author of the paper. And so I'm sure that you, you also replied to her several times. So you should have the record. Otherwise, I can share the drive and you can pick up from the drive if you like. Uh, maybe that's that's the best idea. Um, or Larry, yeah. you could probably you could share it from your computer. To be honest, you could play it from there if that's if that's yes. Easier. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. No worries. Yes, yes, but I'll do it. Don't mute yourself because otherwise it will go silent. Just keep your your speaker on, and if you share it from there, that'd be great. Okay, okay, I'll try to do it. Just give me one second. If I need to search, right. Um, so I'd like to sure, introduce. Sure. Our, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Ramazami, who will be talking more about following on from Dan's presentation. I think uh, um, talking about assessment of microplastics in the southern in Southern Ocean water. So please go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman. And uh, am I audible? You, you are, but could you um, put that into present presenter mode so we have a big screen, if that's possible? Uh, can... Sometimes it doesn't work for me. Uh, so shall I okay. move with this? Can I go ahead with this? Uh, yes, if, if you can't use presenter, just that little screen at the bottom there would, would probably work, but, but if you can't do it, that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll, just try. I'll try, I'll try, I'll try.
Is it now big now? Bigger screen? It's big and is it perfect. Large? Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, I, I'll just check whether it is moving also up and down. Is it moving? Slide is moving? Can you? Uh, yes, that's moving. That's moving. Okay, then, then thank you. Thank you. So, uh, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And uh, I am I am Professor Ramasamy. I am from uh, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotem, Kerala. I am very glad. And then I am I, at the outset, I thank the organizers of SCAR 2022 for giving me this opportunity. I'm, I'm sharing with you some of our uh, research on Southern Ocean uh, when I could take part in the uh, Indian scientific expedition to Southern Ocean um, in 19, I mean, 2019, uh, actually. And then, of course, I'm not going into the details of plastics, but only thing is the consumption of plastic has increased the past 50 years. So when the consumption is increased, definitely the discards or wastes are increasing. And then as in many countries, uh, it is mismanaged so that it gets into the water bodies and ultimately it reaches the ocean. And it has, uh, I mean, the plastic debris, uh, they, they fragment into microplastics, which has become a serious topic now, of course, uh, um, because of its pervasiveness and ubiquitous occurrence everywhere. And then it's, it's, its impact on the food web and food chain of the aquatic system is uh, more worrying. And then that, that that's a big concern now, because when it gets into the just now, the earlier speaker mentioned about the, uh, the, 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 the impact of the microplastic in the benthic organisms. So the, the, the overall picture is that when it gets into the biotic products of uh, sea or ocean, it may come back to human beings uh, as, a, as a biotic uh, seafood, uh, it may come back. Or in the abiotic uh, products of the sea like salt, we consume every day, that's also being contaminated with microplastics. Then why Southern Ocean? Southern Ocean, of course, compared to rest of the oceanic regions of the world, the, the work on Southern Ocean is limited. That's why we started this work. Uh, of course, we started somewhere in uh, 2020, 1920. And then the objective was to, because it was a preliminary study from our side, so we just wanted to see the abundance of the microplastic on the different depths of the water column of the Southern Ocean and to characterize them based on the, uh, their shape, size, and polymer profile like that. So I am presenting here the water sample which were collected from eight locations of the Southern Ocean uh, during our expedition in 1920. And then I am. Uh, this is the uh, our team, scientific team, 40 scientists across India were taking part in this uh, expedition in 19. I mean January to Ma March 2020. And this is the our uh, I mean expedition route actually. We we collected samples around 28 samples. I could collect water and sediments. I am here presenting only. Uh, 10 samples, uh, 10 locations uh, of samples of subsurface water. Like we have uh, collected different depth of the water column, but I'm limiting my presentation here only to the subsurface uh, sampling of uh, less than three meter depth what I have taken, uh, eight, eight, eight locations on this uh, uh, expedition. Uh, these samples were collected using Nishkin uh, the uh, water bottles and then it were half of the procedure, like, like initial screening I could do in the onboard, and later, after bringing the uh, sample to the lab, we could do the uh, usual procedure of NOAA, like the, the wet peroxidase oxidation and then density separation followed by filtration, and then uh, take it to stereo microscope to study the abundance, size, color, shape, all that. Then we took to the micro uh, Raman spectroscopy to analyze the polymer uh, content of the microplastic. That was the procedure we have adapted. Uh, so the subsurface water samples, so less than two meter depth, we could take an initial screening on board. Later, the experiment, I mean, the analysis were conducted in our laboratory here. Coming to the results part of it, the overall range of the microplastics abundance in the overall eight sites, I could get something like 1,250 to 2,550 number of microplastic per cubic meter of uh, water. And then the uh, average or mean abundance is 1,618 particles per cubic meter of water. Coming to the shape, different shapes, of course, we could observe, but mostly dominated by the fiber, because the fiber, uh, as uh, presented by earlier presenter, as well as in many research papers, it has been uh, documented that fiber uh, kind of microplastic is more abundant in many of the aquatic systems. The risk with the fiber is that because of its very small size, and then it can get into the food web and food chain and it get trophic level, uh, um, I mean, it will get transferred to traffic level and it's 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 a uh, risk is more when it is more fibers we find than the larger particles 
And coming to the color, of course, we have got abundance of green color. That was more uh, in the uh, in the uh, among the particles what we have collected. Then followed by the transparent, and then um, black color was also there. These were the color different colors of the uh, microplastic particles we could observe. And when we compare with the size. The maximum size range we got was something between 100 to 500 micron micrometer size, which means that uh, again uh, this is also one of the common uh, observation from the reported works in many aquatic uh, oceans that the size range is between 100 and 500 micro micrometers. Again, when it is smaller size, the risk of getting it getting uh, contaminating the uh, the food web and food uh, chain is more. So the lesser size more is the risk. That's what the, many of the papers report. And these are some of the <clears throat> stereo microscopic pictures of the microplastic particles, which we could uh, um, observe uh, in the in study. And of course, polymer profile, we have done the Raman micro Raman spectroscopy. And then there we could find polyethylene and polypropylene, high density polyethylene and polyamide were the uh, particles. And these are the spectra we could uh, observe by observing the uh, uh, microplastic particles in the uh, Raman spectroscopy. And then of course, the, as a conclusion and the way forward, we say that that uh, all the samples, whatever the samples, eight samples we have done analysis, were found with the microplastics and the number abundance, which is matching with some of the earlier reported works on the uh, Antarctic oceans also. Uh, there are some reports which are also saying in thousands of uh, microplastic particles per uh, cubic meter of water. And then so abundance is there and then more studies, of course, need to be focused on further aspects of food web, food chain related works, because, uh, uh, of course, the impacts are also very important. The impacts of these microplastics and their organisms are also to be studied and how they get profit change. And finally, the source. Source, of course, such a long distance uh, uh, distribution would be possible because of the ocean currents as well as the air currents, because through air also they spread across. Uh, so these are the areas which can be worked out in future as far as uh, Southern Ocean is concerned. And then I thank uh, uh, National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, uh, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India for providing me this opportunity to take part in the scientific expedition uh, of Southern Ocean. Also, we have the Department of Science and Technology Safe Facility, Mahatma Gandhi University, where I'm working for providing us the infrastructure to analyze micro Raman spectroscopy and the uh, spectral library and also my research team which has done most of the work and this is my research team they are, almost all of them have completed their doctorate except two or three of them and uh, these are some of our publications of course we have we have got the opportunity to work with arctic norwegian arctic also Kongsford and uh, fjord uh, we could do work on the um, microplastic and the surface sediments there also we have reported it in the marine pollution bulletin and the paper which you see on the bottom of the slide is the one which we have presented, I mean, published in somewhere in 2017. That was the very first report from India on microplastic uh, contamination in a, in a lake uh, in the state Kerala where I am living. And these are some other publications which you could make on air, dust, and all that. And then uh, I, I thank all of you uh, for your patient listening, and I'm uh, ready to take any questions. And at the same time, I thank the organizers of SCAR for providing me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ramazami. Um, we do have a question for you in the chat, but if uh, if we can hold that until the end of the session, because uh, we are running slightly behind schedule, and then we'll revisit those questions at the end, if that's okay. Should I answer now or afterwards? No, I after. think after. If you're able okay. to stay around for a bit, that would be great. Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll later. Okay, I, I shall. I, I shall. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I shall answer later. Yeah, please. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, so yeah. our next speaker is uh, a recording from Joanna, Joanna Frey Gayle, and she will be uh, talking about using penguins as biological samplers of microplastics and other anthropogenic, anthropogenic particles. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Joanna Fregão and today I'm going to present to you my work entitled Microplastic and Other Anthropogenic Particles in Antarctica Using Penguins as Biological Samplers. 
Antarctica is a continent with great relevance, since it presents a unique fauna and history and uh, presents an exploited marine resources. Uh, besides that, Antarctica is an isolated continent with low anthropogenic pressure. Uh, um, this isolation provided by the Southern Ocean um, has also led to specific cold environmental conditions uh, and consequently to a high degree of endemism in this region. So that characteristics promotes international and multidisciplinary world-class science in Antarctica. Antarctica presents influence in three fields sea level, climate, and marine ecosystem, more specific, the ocean currents. Any change that occur in this region can cause consequences for the Earth and humanity. And as you know, the strong signs of global, global climate warming uh, came from the polar regions, more specifically from Antarctica. And the changes that are occurring in Antarctica for the last 13 years are due to the performance of several stress factors, such as the temperature, the salinity, and the pollution. And pollution has direct and indirect effects on the environment, as we know. Uh, and the indirect effects are essentially related to the presence of um, marine litter in aquatic ecosystems. For example, the presence of uh, litter uh, or objects from fishing boats, uh, such as the the plastics, and currently uh, the plastics uh, and the the microplastics in the aquatic environment is a matter of concern due to the consequences they bring to the ecosystem. And you ask, what is a microplastic? And microplastic is uh, right now is an hot topic in science because microplastics are fragments of plastics or um, plastics of primary origin that are smaller than five millimeters. Or they are a little small. And uh, as can be seen in this figure, they can have different shapes, sizes, and colors. Uh, and besides that, they also can be can have different uh, chemical compositions. And we need more studies to know all the effects that they cause in the the species, because we don't know right now. And plastic pollution, as we know, is a big cause through the aquatic environment. And there are a lot of studies supporting the presence of these particles in Antarctica. So you ask, what is the main source? And the possibly main sources, main direct sources of this pollution in Antarctica can be the scientific research stations, the fishing boats, and also the tourist and research boats. And one way to see all this pollution and even how the climate change can affect the organisms is using bioindicators like the penguins that are top predators in Antarctica. And penguins are excellent bioindicators because uh, they are dispersed by Antarctica, they live in colonies, and they are long-lived birds. And besides that, we also know very well their ecology and their life history. And for that reason, uh, they are often used by um, Kamler in Kamler monitoring programs. So in this study, we use three species of penguins, Adeli, Shinsra, and Gento, uh, that they are among the most uh, abundant penguins in the Antarctica region. And these three species feed mean, uh, mainly sorry, on Antarctic krill and uh, um, can also feed in smaller quantities on fish and cephalopods. And these three species present um, small difference in their foraging capacity. capacity. So Adeli penguins uh, present migratory and usually feeding offshore and pelagic habitats, and foraging is diurnal at deeps of 45 meters. Shinstrap generally feed pelagically at deeps of less than 40 meters. Um, 14 meters and foraging more frequently at night. Gento feeds on benthic habitats and close to the coast, and foraging is a uh, diurnal. So the study was conducted at the Antarctic Peninsula um, as a daily shinsharp and Gento uh, breed sympatrically in this region, and we also have a sampling point at Landing Beach, more specific Bird Island, South Georgia. Uh, as you can see in the map, in some of these sampling sites, uh, there was an overlapping of breeding colonies. So a total of uh, 317 penguins cat samples were collected, 
at uh, 10 different breeding colonies and in different um, breeding seasons uh, between 2006 and 2016. So these 317 samples were analyzed in our laboratory and uh, having uh, and we verified the existence of 92 anthropogenic particle, particles sorry and um, as you can see uh, in the table uh, we verified that all the three species uh, in this study had the Antarctic krill as the main component of their diet diet so um, we can also check in the table uh, that regarding anthropogenic particles, uh, these were found in um, all species, however, present uh, different uh, percentages of occurrence, uh, which may be due to the fact that the penguins, as I say, uh, present a different uh, foraging capacity. So 92 anthropogenic particles were recovered, as I say, and um, they are characterized according to their shape, color, and length. And from these two 92 particles, uh, 29 were sent to, an to analysis. Um, the 29 particles analyzed were identified as artificial cellulose and microplastics, more specifically polyethylene and polyester. Polyester, sorry. Uh, however, 10% was not possible to be a certain they, they polymer identification. However, the um, synthetic origin was confirmed. So, uh, cellulose uh, based fibers are made from natural um, resources such as uh, wood pulp and cotton li uh, linters and are. Um, and have an important role in production of tassel. And despite being a natural uh, origin, uh, they can uh, pose an additional threat to the marine environment since they may have associated contaminants. Uh, regarding the polyethylene, uh, is widely used in many applications, such as single-use plastics, so it can several origins. Polyester is commonly associated with the textile industry. So, although the microplastic pollution is ubiquitous, we can conclude that it occurs much less frequently in Antarctica compared to other regions, uh, if we see our data, of course, which may be due to the fact that Antarctica is geographically isolated due to the existence of the Antarctic circumpolar current. So the entry, of, uh, the entry of these microplastics into Antarctica may be due to the direct or indirect sources of pollution, such as the ocean currents. Um, the direct sources of uh, plastic pollution in Antarctica, which may be due to the disposal or inadequate management of the waste produced by fishing boats, tourism boats, research boats, and scientific bases, which have a high density in the Antarctic Peninsula, as you can see in the maps. Um, so this increase in anthropogenic pressure in this region um, leads not only to the destruction of the habitats, but also to a greater conservation challenge. So the results of this study encourage uh, the countries that are part of the Antarctic Treaty to continue to support research and investigation into the effects of microplastic pollution in Antarctic organisms like penguins. And it is imperative to harmonize the, proce the procedures used to, for sampling and monitoring plastics and proposed solutions to minimize environmental risks and impacts on polar ecosystems. Uh, very recently, the SCAR, uh, the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, created an expert group uh, solely dedicated to plastic pollution in polar regions, the Plastic in Polar Environment SCAR Action Group, um, in order to identify the current knowledge gaps and address future researches directions um, uh, to, to the experts and to, to the programs. So this study, we think that they have a great relevance as it is the first of our knowledge to provide the existence of microplastics in Adelo and Shinstra penguins and in penguins from breeding colonies of Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, the Southern Ocean and Antarctic ecosystem 
uh, we saw that are increasingly subject to anthropogenic pressure, so uh, such as uh, fisheries, scientific work in research stations, and even the tourism. And um, this can affect the Antarctic marine food chain. Uh, we think further research is needed to improve the technology of plastic distribution in the Southern Ocean uh, through temporal analysis and monitoring activities that generate comparable data and a greater understanding of the impact, the real impact of this plastic um, in the food chains. And besides microplastics, nanoplastics are becoming a serious global a global environmental problem too and for that reason for the researchers and are needed in antarctica about these these nanoplastics uh, so that said more precautionary measures are likely to be needed in the coming uh, in order to reduce local pollution in antarctica and for conservate the antarctic and southern ocean ecosystem at least and more recently at antarctic treaty meetings held in berlin this article was cited into submitted working papers on microplastic pollution in this region in order to create mitigation and laws. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much to the people that collaborate with me in the in this work. That was another interesting presentation there. Um, we've got one more speaker on our program, but I haven't been able to locate, I think it's Sue, Sumaya. Um, is there anyone in the list of attendees that is here to present on behalf of Sumaya? That was the, the Southern Polar Skewer um, and, and the occurrence of microplastics in Southern Polar Skewer. Is anyone here? If you, if you are, can you please raise your hand? Uh, we haven't heard that, that that talk has been withdrawn, so I'll just give us a second. And then if if there is no one here to present on behalf of Sumaya, um, Clara Pathos, who presented yesterday but the, um, had some hitches with a slide pack, is going to present her work on uh, Antarctic bacteria and their role in, in biodegradation. We'll just give another moment. Is anyone, please, yeah, please do raise your hand if you are here on behalf of Sumaya to talk about the, the um, Southern Polar Skewer. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything there, so um, we'll consider that a withdrawn talk. Uh, but if I can invite uh, Clara, if you're ready to give your presentation, uh, that would be great if you can share your presentation now. Okay. Good morning, dear audience. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project entitled Activity of Acinetobacter Jonsumi in the Degradation of Low-Density Polyethylene. The use of polyethylene is a global problem that's got affecting the environment. However, this accumulation has begun to be seen notably affecting fiercely aquatic species as they die from ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、すみません。ああ、
Please try share screen once again. Could you minimize everything else, which yes. is now. Could you minimize everything else, which is in front of the screen or behind the screen, behind the presentation? Yes, could you yes, could you close that video, please? If not required. I presented my video because I had problems with my camera. Okay, on the right side, you can see a box. Could you close that one, please? If you don't want to move your video. Near to the logos. Near to the logos. Now it's clear? No. Uh, when you are well, in your computer where there is a time, can you see, is there something open on the back side? The time, it says 23.12 there, yes. Is there anything open on the back side of the presentation? That little clipboard um, thing might be something that you could just minimize or close. I'm not sure what that program is, but it's it's covering up part of your slide. Sorry, Clara. So we're not seeing that bottom right hand part of your slide. So in your computer, if you if you can close down every everything except Zoom, obviously, and PowerPoint, that may fix the issue, I suspect. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's a problem within here. I think it's a problem with, um, as the IT guys were saying, with Something other- Something in the back side. Yeah. Um, so when we could, yeah, there was a clipboard of some description. I think that might be what it is. Uh, um, can you minimize this window, please? Minimize the presentation. Okay. Could you move it to the left side? Um, it, is it perhaps between your icons at the bottom, you have PowerPoint, then you have a, a clipboard or a, or a movie start guide, then you have Zoom, that, that white icon, is that, is that a program that's open that you could close? I don't know if that might help. Can you refresh this, right click and refresh?
Yeah, I am refreshed. Mm -hmm. I think Clara will just have to um if we keep going, we'll just have to acknowledge that we can't see that the right hand corner of your slide. Um, it's better than it was, definitely better than it was. So if you, I think we just better, in the interest of, of moving on with the, with the session. I think that's max that we can do as of now. Can we start? Yep. Okay. That looks good. Thank you. Good morning, dear audience. Today I'm going to talk about the research project entitled Activity of Acinetobacter Jonsumi in the Degradation of Low Density Polyethylene. The use of polyethylene is a global problem that's got affecting the environment. However, this accumulation has begun to be seen notably affecting fiercely aquatic species as they die from starvation and strangulation. And human health because we ingest throughout food chain, indirectly microplastic signs, the mind died for people is composed of seafood. For this reason, the research is carried out to evaluate the degradation of polyethylene using extremophile microorganisms. For this purpose, uh, Antarctic microorganisms isolated from Pedro Vicente Maldonado station was used. A pure cultured was obtained from the sample, which was said in Luria Bertana brought and keep a temperature of 15 grados Celsius. Due to the taxonomy complex, a molecular techniques were applied. First, DNA extraction using master pure kit modification were made in the quantities of the established reagents. Universal primers 27 forward and 518 rivers were applied in the polymerase chain reaction. The results were visualized in electrophoresis scale. The polymerase chain reaction products was purified using a Kyogen PCR kit. Finally, the samples were sent to sequencing the result was analysis in silico using Genius Prime and NCBI Blast program. The sample supplier with primer showed advance with molecular wave of 1,500 pairs pass, indicating that the amplification of 16 genes. Through a liquid program, it was confirmed that the microorganisms belonged to the species Acinetobacter johnson being the first report in Antarctica. This species has an open path, a great adaptability to different environments. It can be widely distributed in natural environments under cold ecosystem conditions and can also be found in clinical settings. Antarctic microorganisms were used because they have shown encouraging results in bioremediation. If the environment conditions like pH, temperature are improved, the capacity of bacteria could be improved. Furthermore, Acinetobacter johnsoni has already been studied in other studies to degrade nitrogenous compounds and oils. Being a heterotrophic species, it can depend to wide variety of carbon source. 
The plastic used was oxobiodegradable, low density polyethylene with ultraviolet light and twin 80 retreatments were applied. The degradation requires physical, chemical, and biological process because the pretreatments helps to despolymerize the plastic with the bacteria at with their metabolism to transform oxidized products into carbon dioxide and biomass. Twin 80 has a surfactant effect that causes flexibility in the polymer. The surfactant due to its ethylene oxide composition allowed it to act on oxidation when it comes into contact with the plastic, filling the space free in the polymer. Twin 80 is a low toxicity compound, so it has been used in bioremediation. In the case of the ultraviolet light, this allows the activation of the prooxidants additives present in the plastic, which cause the polymer rupture to accelerate. In addition, it's a friendly process with the environment as long as the radiation is not so high. The first consists of a spur of a 365 nanometers, and the second, a twin 80 solution was prepared, and the plastic was washed in the solution with the help of a mini shaker. For the gradation development, a bioreactor batch was designed with two compartments. In the first compartment, a growth synthesis could be measured, and the second compartment contained sodium hydroxide solution. Throughout this compartment, it was possible to calculate of amount of carbon dioxide release. This design was used to prevent the escape of carbon dioxide into the environment, which can be harmful. Therefore, a sodium hydroxide solution was placed in the second compartment to capture the gas. This reaction caused carbon dioxide to increase as hydroxyl ions are consumed, forming sodium bicarbonate as a result. Additionally, a uh, infrared spectroscopy and dry weight analysis were performed to demonstrate the physical change in of the polymer. As a result, it was obtained that the plastic with 280 allowed the bacteria was obtained the best dynamic of the ground and a reduction in the weight of polymer of approximately one grain was visualized. However, the carbon dioxide was low. It is explained in the infrared spectroscopy where there was not major change in absorbent and transmittance spectra. In this way, it was determined that altitude the capacity of Acinetobacter Johnson was low. What stands out is capacity of adaptability in the medium under stress condition. Besides, it is the first report of the polyethylene degradation process, which opened a path of future research. In conclusion, only one sustainable Alternative is offered to solve a part of plastic problem that continues to be challenging in science. Thank you. Sorry for all the inconvenience. Uh, just to thank you all for your attention. No problem. We we got there in the end, Clara. So thank you for that. Um, that's the that's the conclusion of our talks uh, for this afternoon. So I'd like to thank um, our six speakers for those interesting presentations, which I'm hoping now will generate um, some more questions and a bit of a discussion amongst the the attendees here. So um, we touched on a few. I'll get I'll get Kath to run through if there's any questions, but just to touch on some of those key themes within this session. 
um, see if we have any areas that people are particularly interested in discussing further. So we had a bit of, had some nice talks on you know, distribution and, and transport of microplastics in the Southern Ocean. Uh, we had a little bit about local versus global sources of microplastics and the role of, of stations and wastewater uh, as sources of microplastics to the environment. Uh, we had a couple of talks, we missed one on the skewers, unfortunately, but had a couple of talks on the, the use of bioindicators um, of exposure to an uptake of microplastics to, to everything from macro, macro invertebrates through to penguins, which was great. And, and then a little bit also about the, the actual toxicity or the, the impacts other than bioaccumulation, the impacts of microplastics on the, on the krill embryos. So really nice um, suite of, of talks there to represent research in the microplastic world in the Southern Ocean and, um, and coastal Antarctica. So I thank you all for, for those great contributions and for coming together for this session. Um, so there's just some ideas. And Kath, I'll throw to you to see if there's any uh, questions that might want to elaborate, uh, might people might, might want to elaborate on. Um, and, and just if the, also, if, if you are a e-poster um, author that would like to discuss your e-poster in this forum now over the next half hour or so, um, just raise your hand as well. And likewise, if you, if you want to speak rather than chatting, um, we can all go into the, the um, panelist arena, which is where you can actually have your microphones on. So if, if you'd like to talk, raise your hand, please, your virtual hand. Uh, and if you're an e-poster presenter and you want to talk about that, please raise your hand. Thanks, Kath. Over, over to you for questions. Great, thanks. Uh, we had some questions in the chat um, earlier for Dan Wilson, which he has um, typed in some mess, uh, answers to, but it, it may be may be good to just go over those. Um, Rob Massam asked to what depths do the plastics mainly occur and what is the depths of the NOAA drifters? Um, so I don't know if you you wanted to just uh, talk through that as well, Dan, on, on your previous answer. Yeah, of course. Um, so it's a really interesting question, actually. Uh, so it can describe kind of microplastics as a kind of a ubiquitous marine contaminant. They're kind of the the present kind of pretty much everywhere. Um, and so whilst plastics mainly enter the oceans at the ocean surface, over time, as plastics break down and, uh, and sediments and algae that are in the water kind of uh, bind onto these plastics, the densities of plastics can change. So you end up with this spreading of plastics throughout the water column. And I think there's a really interesting statistic somewhere that of, of all the plastics that we estimate to be in the global oceans, only kind of 1% or so has been observed at the ocean surface. So there's this kind of the idea of this missing 99%. So kind of there is a huge amount of uncertainty in terms of the depth distribution of plastics, which um, kind of highlights the importance of Professor Ramasai's study when he's looking at the depth distributions of microplastics um, using C2D water from different depths in the water column. Um, and so in terms of the, the NOAA global, global drifter project drifters that we compared our model to kind of in a kind of ground truthing exercise, um, so those drifters are formed of um, a large buoy that sits at the ocean surface with the, the GPS tracker and the communication systems. And that's attached to a, a parachute that sits at 15 metres depth. So the drifter represents the currents that are taking place at 15 metres depth rather than the ocean surface. Um, and I mentioned in uh, that answer to the question that when we were doing our modelling, we maintained 15 metres depth throughout. So we used flow fields from 15 metres depth. Um, and we made sure that particles model drifters stayed at 15 meters depth to get kind of the best comparison to those, those kind of real world, if you like, global drifter project drifters. Thanks, Dan. And uh, that's 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 really interesting. Um, uh, on on that um, question, I was wondering, do you have uh, indications of how these um, patterns of distribution might change with anticipated climate change uh, current uh, influences? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, and it's something that over the last kind of few months, we've started to think about a bit more in my project. So we're thinking of looking at kind of the impact of the SAM, the Southern Anion Mode, and the impact of the Pacific Decadal observation. So the model data that we've got goes back to the, um, the early 1980s 
all the way through to 2017. So what we're thinking of doing is looking at different years. So for example, comparing years where there's been um, a high SAM index and comparing the, how the transport of plastics differs between a high SAM index year and a low SAM index year. And from that, we can start to make kind of um, potential interpretations as to how microplastics transport might change with global warming and climate change. I um, mean, it links really interestingly into sea ice as well, which is something that Emily mentioned in her talk. I um, mean, I kind of briefly mentioned at the end of the talk is sea ice has this potential to kind of effectively soak up plastics. Um, and with sea ice being uh, traveling in different directions to the underlying ocean currents as it's more impacted by the wind, as you say, with climate change and changing patterns of sea ice distribution, that's another thing that could, uh, could really impact the transport of plastics in the Southern Ocean. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you. And uh, there was another question uh, from Chen Jung Sun uh, for yourself, Dan, uh, which asked, do you factor in the vertical transportation of the microplastics? Um, would you yeah, like to so talk a bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Um, so that's something that we're really looking forward to, actually. Um, so that these orchestra flow fields that we've got to um, to advect our model with are three dimensional. So we've got seventy five depth layers. Um, so we're just at the minute in the pro in the process of adjusting our model so that it can run in three dimensions. So one of those things will be adding a vertical diffusive component. Um, and once we've got our model up and running in three dimensions, we can then start to look at um, including plastics of different densities. So having rising and settling velocities for different plastics, depending on their densities, which should hopefully give us some really interesting insights into how plastics are moving around the Southern Ocean and kind of looking almost kind of below the surface and so not just what's happening on the surface, but also what's happening at depth. So that could be a, could be really interesting. It'll be uh, we'll, one of the things we'll look at is potentially could plastics be kind of almost dipping underneath the Antarctic circumpolar current. So if particles of a kind of a neutral or slightly negative buoyancy are sinking, and then being upwelled south of the Antarctic circumpolar current will be something that's really interesting to look at to see if that's taking place. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Thank and uh, a, a couple of other questions, which uh, Dr. Ramasamy answered around uh, water what was the water volume for your vertical sampling. Um, that's a simple question, but I don't know if you want to elaborate at all around that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to elaborate. Of course, uh, uh, we have taken 20 liters of sample per site in duplicates. So we have done the analysis in total 40 liters per site like that we have taken. Regarding the depth, of course, we have taken different depths ranging from uh, 50 hundred, thousand, sometimes the deepest part. So those samples are, uh, I mean, we are compiling the results. It is, that's why I have not included it. Of course, we have done it. Also, we have done sediment samples from the Southern Ocean, around 3,500 meters sediment deep ocean. Sa sediment samples are with us. We are doing that. We are here to finalize it. So the volume is uh, 20 plus 20, 40 liters we have taken. I have presented only the result of subsurface, like less than two meters, whatever you have collected, only the abundance I have given for this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got uh, a couple of uh, questions in from Scott Stark, uh, who says, I get the impression that while the Antarctic uh, CC is largely protecting Antarctic from Antarctica from externally derived microplastics for now, this may not be the case long term. Can the speakers address this possibility? Actually, Dan just addressed this redensity differentiation of plastics and vertical transport. It's a really interesting uh, if, point, actually. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a really interesting point in the idea that the Antarctic circumpolar current can kind of act as this barrier to southward transport. Um, and it's kind of um, these kind of questions of how plastics are crossing the Antarctic circumpolar current have been kind of um, kind of prompted by research that's found plastics in the Southern Ocean. And this idea that there's 
and effectively too much plastic in the southern ocean for it just to be coming for local sources. Um, so yes, yeah, so it'll be really interesting to see kind of the processes that actually are allowing plastics to cross the Antarctic circumpolar current. So one of the things that we're looking at in our model is that um, it's eddy resolving. So potentially it could be that eddies are kind of almost kind of grabbing a parcel of water that contains plastics. And then over time, as that eddy is moving around the, around the Southern Ocean, it's then releasing those plastics kind of south of that front. And that could almost be happening repetitively and plastic could be zigzagging their way across kind of the Antarctic circumpolar current. Or potentially, as I, I mentioned a minute ago, the idea that these plastics could potentially be dipping underneath the Antarctic circumpolar current. But it's, yeah, it's certainly an interesting question. And hopefully some of the modeling that I'm able to do can potentially kind of raise some potential transport pathways and ideas as to how this transport might be happening. Yeah, it sounds very complex and complicated. So lots of interesting things to investigate there. Yeah. Um, that's that's the questions that we have so far in the chat box. So um, yeah, opening up for uh, further questions and discussion. Uh, may I add one point uh, to Dr. Dan's uh, uh, expression? Actually, I also come across came across uh, such kind of uh, negative ions in the Arctic fjords. So the the, the microplastics uh, polymers of high density polyethylene or uh, low density polyethylene. Uh, I could observe them in the sediments. Like they are supposed to float, but they were found in the sediments. Like, as you said, maybe biofouling or any other complex thing, which might have brought it down to the sediment. So the flux of the vertical flux of the plastic particles, microplastic particles, is a very interesting area of study. Any, I mean, Southern Ocean or wherever you take. Uh, I, I want to do more on that, I mean, if any, collaboration is that in that aspect i would be grateful to join i mean i'm just placing it before the scar committee because they are getting transported down and then they will come out also uh, that way going down means they will get into the benthic organisms uh, then food web it will get uh, escalated later that's why it's very interesting thank you yes yeah. we certainly had evidence of of um, that transport down and, and accumulation with this, in the sediments through the um, the finding of, of Elisa's finding and Alaria's finding of microfibers within the whelk, which is a you know purely a benthic species, so it's feeding on the on the films on on sediment. I assume, Alaria, would you like to comment more on that and also the choice of species? Uh, if there was anything. Um, that drew you to the whelk as a, as a potential biomonitor? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we were quite uh, astonished by the fact that we didn't find lots of microplastics as they are in, the, in those uh, benthic species while we found uh, fibers. So it's clear that a local scale, probably we are polluting the coastal areas. So what is coming uh, directly in the bays is coming from the sewages of the scientific station and uh, this is something that we have to take action very soon because this is quite clear that the match between the spectra of the fibers retrieved in the whelk and those find, found in the in the clothes of the uh, personnel of the bases is pretty clear i mean there is no doubt and at the same time other people or other colleagues they found traces of microplastics but actually there were more rubber and piece of paints so I'm not sure that we, when we call microplastics, as we see in other oceans, they may be found in the same type and shape in the, in the Southern Ocean. So what you guys are telling us about models, I, I think is very important and relevant in terms of a global ocean transport, but then we have to take action towards local sources. And it is much easier, I think, because it's just a fact to understand that we are of course, making our footprint locally in our scientific basis. And uh, it's easy to take action in this direction, I think, in a shorter time. And uh, so we are looking forward to move uh, in this direction in the, in the next months. Yeah, um, Ilaria, I was struck by um, the percentage, um, not being a microplastics researcher, uh, when you said that 33% was a, a low percentage, it, how does that compare into other regions? What what kind of percentage is high? 
Well, indeed, yes, the, 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 the quantity that we found in the work is very low compared to the Mediterranean, for instance, which now is recognized as an hotspot of microplastics. This quantity is extremely low, but at the same time, these species are not experiencing this type of pollution. While I guess that the Mediterranean area, that species may be more adapted in the years, more than 50 years of plastic release in the, in the sea, might have uh, somehow have uh, some uh, positive response from the species. While those living in the Antarctica probably are experiencing really now for the first time, this type of pollution. Uh, as far as I know, these, these clothes made of uh, cellulose fiber and uh, probably little plastic, synthetic plastic are quite recent. So they have been used in the Antarctic and in the last 55 years, uh, sorry, 25 years. So probably we are talking about a very low amount, but there is no information yet about the impact. So now we have to move on to understand how those fibers are making an impact on those species. And we know from the Mediterranean area that the, the impact of fibers can be quite important in terms of toxic effects. If we think about fibers and uh, in terms of human health, we know that there are some which are very toxic where they become in the nanoscale. So this is something very important to others. Hmm. We had a um, hand up earlier from Chen Gun Sun. Did you want to speak now? <laughs> You're on mute, by the way. You'll need to unmute yourself. Oh, oh, thank you. And Dr. Okay, Brown good. did pronounce yeah. did pronounce my last name right. <laughs> so uh, oh. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So this is the <laughs> this is the first time I joined SCAR. Actually, I was uh, recruited by our polar research. Uh, like administration to get involved in SCAR. And I have listened to all the talks and it's great. It's a great session. And thank you for the hosting, Dr. King. This is so nice. And I asked two questions, both to Dan and Dr. Ramasamy. It's just because we have been doing microplastic research uh, for uh, almost seven years. Actually, I'm from the first Institute of Oceanography in China and I belong to the Ministry of Natural Resources in China. And for our experience, you know, we have been doing research in the Antarctic area for the past three years, and we have done three expeditions over there. And so far, we have collected samples and we almost finished all the water samples around the Antarctic. So like we circulated, <laughs> we have a circle. And hopefully we'll have the data out by the end of this year or the beginning of next year. And I would think these basic data will help to either do the modeling or to assess the impact that the microplastic might have on the Antarctic. And from our results so far, I would think tourism might be an, an important factor affecting the microfibers around the Antarctic area because we have found so many fibers in the seawater sample. And Dr. Both, uh, both Dan and Dr. Ramasamy just talked about the density, separation of the vertical transportation of the microplastics. And actually, you will find the smaller the microplastic goes, the less effect uh, will be the density. So when they get small enough, then you can't just use density to say, okay, this one will be distributed in this layer of water. So that's what we, we found so far. So I just want to add to that. So uh, hopefully we'll have more collaborations with people in the field. And I hope our data will contribute to this, uh, you know, to better understanding of the microplastic in this area as well. So thank you for answering all my questions because, uh, you know, we have done a lot of methodology uh, research as well. And we found it really depends on what method, both sampling and analysis. Both of the methods will greatly affect the data you report. And I have been working with the Pisces and we are working towards standardizing, standardizing the method you use so we can have a cross like a uh, comparison of all the data. And so far, I think uh, 
for most of the comparison, the best you can do is we use the mantle chow with 330 micron size mesh. And then those data, you can do all the comparisons with the historical data. But then still how people analyze or identify the polymers is another key factor affecting the results. So I just want to bring that up as well. Thank you for letting me talk host. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you. On, and on that, we have another comment from Scott Stark uh, saying, yes, there are many things that can affect plastic density, including absorption of organics or inorganic species or biofilm growth. It's also been shown, for example, that even the color affects the natural decomposition of plastics, for example, their UV absorption, and hence influences the generation of microplastics. Thanks, Scott. Um, Kath, I just had a, a comment. Thank you, Chen Yung, for bringing this up. Um, this, stand, this, this idea around standardisation of approach, this is a relatively new area of research in Antarctica or in the Southern Ocean. I think as an international community, it is so important that we standardise these practices and the ways that we analyse and look for plastics so that it is, so that we can pull together. It's a very vast ocean area that we're talking about. And if we are to you know, truly make inroads as, a, as an international community, then that, that um, standardised approach and, and, and methods is, is really critical. So I, I um, appreciate you bringing that up um, within this group. I don't know if anyone wants to comment further. I mean, there's a lot to be learned from other areas, obviously, but um, Antarctica has its own unique problems, obviously, for sampling. And um, sometimes we can't always do the best practice that, that might be appropriate for other areas. Well, if I can add something, as a plastic scar action group, we are very, very um, keen in doing this. So standardization is so important, especially because if you are talking about low level of contamination, so we are looking at traces. And as our colleague said, fibers are really tricky to analyze. So we have to be very careful in not mistaking that, for instance, cellulose is of natural origin or is of synthetic origin. So the spectra that we analyze are very, very important in terms of information that we get and important in terms of sources, because this can really be linked the exposure with the sources of those plastic. And of course, tourism is a, a very important issue, but there is a lot of collaboration going on with the YATO at the moment, and they are very sensitive toward plastic pollution. And I hope in the future we can do more with them. So in terms of standardization, I think it's not only science that has to move on, but also our other actions in terms of uh, uh, having a, a really impact and giving numbers which are meaning in terms of importance. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Ilaria. Is there anyone, is there anyone else um online that wants to raise a particular topic to introduce to the group that we might discuss. We've got another 10 minutes before people might want to be going to other sessions. Or any further questions for any of our um, speakers today? Or, or even discussions of broader than microplastics, like this really is a wrap up of, of this three part um, session on solutions to pollution. Um, I had a just a general question um, around potential toxicity of the different plastics. And um, I'm not sure if any of the speakers have um, no indications around which, um, as, as you said, the nanoplastics are, are looking like more of a problem, but as far as the different plastic types, um, some of the um, more modern uh, plastics, I am, as again, not being an expert on this at all, imagining that there may be um, more uh, complex toxic compounds that, um, that maybe have more availability and toxicity. Um, from what you've observed and collected in the Southern Ocean and 
in the benthic ones, are there any plastics that you've identified that you think may be a bigger problem as, as far as their composition goes is in toxicity? That, that question's open to anyone on the on the floor that wants to. Uh, unfortunately, um, Emily isn't with us to talk about that in terms of the work that she's done on toxicity, but is there anyone else that might be able to discuss that? Maybe I can briefly say a few words. <laughs> right. Thank so you. actually most of the lab toxicity was done with the polystyrene with nano size because that kind of, most of the impact will be penetrating the cell walls and then causing this uh, like negative effects. And for the micro ones, most of the micro ones will be excluded from the animals most of the time. So most of the toxicity study done in the lab is on the nano size. And uh, there have been a lot of research that found the additives will have more impacts than the plastic itself. So I think now the research field is still debating what is the toxicity of microplastic, whether it's from the plastic itself or it's from the nano size or it's from the additives because they do have a ton of additives in there. And all the leachant from the plastic will have more severe side effects on the marine organisms or other organisms so far. So that's uh, as far as I know. And there, and there have been research, uh, you know, they found that the micro size close to uh, the nano size, close to the micro size, a couple hundred microns can be absorbed by the plants as well. So they will go through the you know, the trophic level to through the plants and then different animals. And then eventually they may impact the human being. So that's why people are so concerned with microplastics. I just might follow okay. on from, from that. Um, the, the, I mean, there has been some work with krill that I, that I was involved with uh, several years ago with in the microplastic space in terms of feeding, feeding microplastics to krill to see their capacity to cope with that. and. And in, another interesting factor in this, with that, with that, uh, with impacts on tro on different trophic levels, is that we did find that the krill could actually process the microplastics and would actually break it down into smaller fragments, potentially making it more available um, in their excretion to other organisms. So it's not just that it's not just that they're getting into the organisms and they're actually they sometimes being released in a different form, which might actually be in a more available or toxic form as well. So that's another thing that I, I think we, we don't have any handle on really what that what that processing, once it's gone through um, organisms, what that then means. So yeah. Yeah, that's so right. I think the I think one of the biggest problems we have so far is we don't know how many or particles or how much microplastic and nanoplastics are in the environment because we don't mm. have the techniques to analyze those, especially nanoplastics. And for micro size, as long as they go down below, I would say usually around 10 micrometers, then it's very hard to identify them or even to isolate. So I think that's one, even uh, Dr. King just said the krill will fragment, I'll say it will break those microplastics to smaller size and that will eventually maybe, you know, create more nano or small sized plastics, you know, and be released into the environment. And the impact of those is hard to predict so far. Yeah. Mm. I, I was also thinking around the, the changes in the plastics that would occur with uh, weathering and um, and then the, uh, the chemical composition with uh, potentially more toxic um, metabolites from, from the original plastics uh, and, and that there may be a, a great range of variability in toxicity of one particular um, plastic, depending on how it's been weathered and, and, um, and broken down and changed over time. So that, yes, that could be an, another um, variable of 
of, of time and chemistry um, in the mix as well. I think uh, we have a comment in here from Ilaria. She's saying she's apologizing her Zoom closed down. She'll be, she's back again, but she can't speak, only listen and type here. So uh, her comment is toxicity is indeed affected by shape, size and mass, but more way to go to analyze the real size of nanoplastics occurring in the environment. Ilaria, you may be able to speak now. I think you are back online. Uh, but you're mute. Yes, can you hear me now? Good. Yes. yes we have okay, you. Yes, because my, my Zoom is, is having fun. Uh, anyway, I think uh, I'm going down in a few minutes. Anyway, yes, uh, all the consideration you made about toxicity indeed are so important. So also in terms of a standardization of methods uh, to recognize shape, size, and uh, fragmentation, how is going on, what type of fragments are originating from larger pieces of plastic are indeed needed. So there's a lot of methodological issue, analytical technical issue that we have to solve. And it's not only a problem of uh, retrieving plastic, is to analyze plastic and to understand what is really organism and take it from the environment. And also Kat mentioned the fact that organisms are also making their, um, their uh, change in the plastic themselves because they may digest plastic and especially fibers and they make uh, uh, more uh, smaller size. So indeed, in terms of toxicity, there is a long way to go, especially in the Antarctica, where the data are so low. Thank you. Thanks, Ilaria. I think we'll um, better call the session to a close so that people can move to the next sessions if they're still attending aspects of, of SCAR. But I just want to say a very big thank you to all of you for, for being here today and and as well the last two sessions yesterday. It's been really interesting, really diverse range of talks and even within the microplastic space to have so many different aspects covered here and bring us all together is, is really wonderful. So thanks for um, your submissions and for those wonderful presentations. And I'm hoping that the next SCAR we might not be online because it's uh, not quite the same thing doing this uh, as doing it face to face. So, but um, it's, it's worked pretty well. So. Thank you everyone and all the best for the rest of this uh, conference as well. And don't forget to get to the e-posters if you haven't seen them. Um, there's quite a few good ones for this session too. All right, thanks guys. Thank you. All the best. Thank you all. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you, really you so much. Thank you. All right, cheers.